Confocal fluorescence microscopy is what we're going to be talking about today. So, confocal fluorescence microscopy is used to examine specimens that have been treated to make them fluoresce when they are excited by something, a light source. So, scientists use this to see not only a particular part of a specimen or something that's moving in a specimen, but also to produce 3D images of the specimen or a microscopic particle or something like that. And Dr. Scarpinato of the biology department here at Georgia Southern actually uses this in her research. So we'll be talking about what she does and how it is used. So um, in convocal fluorescence microscopy, to produce the images, a light source, which is usually in a laser, is shot towards a dichromatic mirror which is then, which then focuses the light through an objective, which focuses the light all on the specimen and on a specific focal plane. And then as the light bounces off the object, it, it goes through the objective again, where it is then focused to the photomultiplier detector, where it, it picks up the light. And the machine also has pinhole apertures to only let a certain wavelength through so that, that way you know what you're detecting because images can appear very fuzzy if you're not detecting just a very specific wavelength of the, of the fluorescence. They can, the images will be fuzzy and all this stuff so the pinhole aperture really focuses so you get very clear crisp images. And um, the way the molecules fluoresce is when they're excited by the light they jump up an energy level and then as they go back down to their original normal energy level, they give off a photon. And this photon is what the detector is detecting and is what actually is the fluorescence. Is this photon that's given off when the particles jump from the excited state and then go back down to the non-excited state. They give off this photon of the energy they absorbed. And the photons are very specific wavelengths. so each type of fluorescence will give off a different photon, which is a different color. So the limit of detection on these machines really depends on how nice of a machine you have. Because each machine can have a different source of light, different filters, and different detectors in the machine. And this can make a big difference on your limited detection. Because if you have a very, very cheap filter, your images are going to appear blurry, you're not going to be able to get as good of da data or anything like that. So a lot of this really depends on how nice of an instrument you're willing to buy. Because you can buy one that is extremely specific, like the one Georgia Southern recently bought. It's a very, very good one, but they, we paid $400,000, or yeah, $400,000 for it. That's a lot of money, so, you know really depends on, you can also buy a really cheap confocal microscope, microscope and put a really good filter on it and that will really increase the sharpness of your images because that's just what the filter does. And then there's also different types of fluorescent proteins so that can really affect your limited detection because if you're using, you know, a green fluorescent protein it might, it'll give off one wavelength, while red fluorescent will give off another and just your machine will pick up different things depending on what you put into it. And so there's really a wide range of limited detection depending on your machine. So here at Georgia Southern, you know, this is an example of Dr. Scarpinato's data that she's collected. And as you can see, there's a lot of different stuff you can get from it. Some of the images produced, you can see that the protein she's tracking here, um, say in image B, the protein is all over that cell, but you can see where it fluoresces brighter in the middle than it does on the outside, so the um, protein is more focused in the nucleus in that image, while on image C, the protein that they're tracking is more, you know, is way more present in the cytoplasm than in the nucleus of the cell. So you're able to track stuff like that, and you're also able with this machine to make ratios, so you can you know, track how much of the protein percentage-wise is in the cytoplasm versus the nucleus of the cell. 
which is what you have at the bottom in the graph, where she's tracking where this protein is in the cell. And the reason she's doing this is because she was trying to determine in this protein it moves in between the cytoplasm and the nucleus as it is doing work on the cell. It has to, it repairs the DNA when it's damaged. So it's normally located in the cytoplasm, but when it has to repair DNA, it moves to the um, nucleus. And so this, um, this protein, she tracks it to see, you know, when is it located more? And then she wanted to know, well, she thought the N-terminal might have something to do with it moving from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. So she damaged the N-terminal region in different places and to different degrees and then measured, does it still move from the cytoplasm to the nucleus? Turns out, it doesn't move as well from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. So she was able to determine that the N-terminal region of this protein, which is um, very, you know, needed for repair of DNA and it's a mismatch repair system that it does actually need this um, in terminal region to have minimal mutations and minimal damage for the protein to still work. So confocal fluorescence microscopy was very, you know, instrumental in discovering this and being able to prove this. And so that is all I have for today. And here